All right, so in chapter six, we're going to talk about the skeletal system. And as always, the question that we always have to answer, or that I always ask at the beginning of the chapter, is how does structure determine function? So there's a couple guiding questions that I'm going to have for you uh, to think about. Um, so the first one is, how did the shape of the bone influence the movement of the joint? So when we actually start talking about the shapes of bones, we're going to specifically pay attention to the shapes of the joints and how the shapes of the joints influence the amount of movement that joint can have. And then the second question is, how does the formation of osteons differ from trabeculae, which we're going to talk about today, which in turn determines the function of compact bone versus spongy bone. So compact bone and spongy bone, we've talked about briefly in the previous chapter, but when we talk about compact and spongy bone in this chapter, we're going to talk about how different their functions are. So the first thing we always talk about are what are the functions. So in terms of the functions of the skeletal system, the first one is support. The skeletal system provides a framework, right? And that framework supports vital organs, supports you, maintains posture. The second function is protection. So for example, like bones of the skull, right? Particularly the cranium or your ribs. These guys provide protection to house or protect uh, your vital organs. The third function is movement, right? So like we talked about before, when two bones come together, this forms a joint. And how this joint is shaped or how these bones fit together will determine the type of movements that that joint can have. And then the fourth function is storage. So bone acts as a storage center, right? In particular, it's going to store uh, something called yellow marrow and red marrow. Yellow marrow is fat, right? It's going to have some fat component to it. And yellow marrow will be used as uh, an energy source. And then the second type is red marrow. Now, red marrow is a substance found within this thing called the medullary cavity. And within red marrow, you are going to find these things called stem cells. Stem cells are unique because stem cells have the ability to become any type of cell if programmed correctly. And then the last function is blood cell production. So within your bones, within this thing called the medullary cavity, you have these things called stem cells. And as I mentioned, stem cells can become any type of blood cell in this particular case. And these blood cells will eventually become or differentiate into a red blood cell, a white blood cell, or platelets. So there are four classifications of bone, right? There are four classifications of bone. The first classification of bone is called the long bone. So a long bone, by definition, it is taller than it is wider. Okay, So it's taller than it is wider. The long bone that you see here is a femur. The second classification of bone is a short bone. So we classify a short bone as being as tall as it is wide. Examples of short bones would be bones of the wrist or carpals or bones of the uh, ankles, also known as tarsals. The next classification of bones are what we call flat bones. So as the name implies, right, these bones are going to be broad and flat. Examples of flat bones are uh, the bones of the cranium, right, which are the part of the skull that houses the brain. And the scapula right, is also classified as a flat bone. And then the last classification of bone is called an irregular bone. And we define a re an irregular bone as a bone that does not fit any of the other three ca categories. So an irregular bone is not long, it's not short, and it's not flat. It's irregular. Examples of irregular bones are the bones of the face and bones of your vertebral column. So now we're going to talk a look, uh, take a look at some general features of a typical long bone. And these general features are what we call macro structures. Macro structures meaning these are large structures, structures you can see without the aid of a microscope. So the first thing we want to point out when we look at a long bone is this long middle area right here. This is called the shaft or the diaphysis. At the ends of a typical long bone are these little knobby ends, which we call the epiphyses. Epiphyses is plural, epiphysis is singular. At the ends of the epiphyses, you will see something called articular cartilage. Artic, A-R-T-I-C, means joint. So articular cartilage is cartilage that you find at the joints where two bones come together. The next structure on a typical long bone is something called the epiphyseal plate. Now in this diagram, you can't really see the epiphyseal plate, and we'll talk more about the epiphyseal plate when we talk about endochondral ossification. 
but you can barely see a line running across right here. This is the epiphyseal plate, and down here, if I were to take a cross section of this bone and show you the internal part of this bone, you would see an epiphyseal plate right about in this area. The next structure is called the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity is this hollow chamber that runs the length of the diaphysis. Within the medullary cavity is where you'll find a substance called red bone marrow. Next is the periosteum. Peri, P-E-R-I, means around or to surround. Oste means bone. Periosteum is the connective tissue that surrounds the outer part of the bone, right? Periosteum, connective tissue that surrounds the outer part of the bone. And then the last structure is called the endosteum. Endo, end, means inside. Oste means bone. So the endosteum is the inner membrane, right? It's the inner membrane that lines the medullary cavity. Okay? It's the inner membrane that lines the medullary cavity. Okay? So again, all these structures are what we call macro structures. Structures you can see without the aid of a microscope. So the next set of structures are what we call microstructures. And the reason why we call them microstructures is because you need the aid of a microscope in order to see these things. All right, so back in chapter four, right, when we studied tissues, underneath the microscope, you guys looked at bone, right? You didn't know exactly what you were looking at, and I had you guys label these structures. Now I'm going to actually go over the names of these structures for you. So when you look at this diagram right here, or this image, right, this histology picture of bone tissue, the first thing I want you to notice is this large circle, right? This large circular structure right here. This large circular structure is called an osteon. An osteon is a long cylindrical structure that runs the length of the diaphysis. An osteon is made up of several parts. The first part is called an osteocyte. An osteocyte is a mature bone cell that maintains bone. These little black dots, these are all osteocytes. Now osteocytes, as I mentioned to you before, they help maintain and possibly produce bone. The bone that they produce is a ring of bone called the lamella. When you look at this osteon, hopefully you can kind of see these concentric rings of bone. These rings of bone are what we call lamella. Okay, the rings of bone are what we call lamella. At the center of an osteon is something called the haversian canal or central canal. And within the central canal, you will find blood vessels. You'll find arteries and you'll find veins that run through the central canal. And then finally, you have tiny little canals located between osteocytes and located between uh, the central canal. So these tiny little squiggly lines that you see right here, these are tiny little canals. And those tiny little canals are called canaliculi. So as the name implies, canals, they are going to help transport substances. So the, if you look at the canaliculi, Right? They're all connected to the central canal, which are connected to the individual osteocytes so that the osteocytes can get the nutrients they need from the blood vessels and then also pass out waste from the stuff that they produce. So there are two types of bone in the human body. The first one's called compact bone or dense bone. Compact bone is found in the diaphysis or the shaft. Okay? And compact bone is made up of osteons. And these osteons, like I mentioned to you before, are long cylindrical structures that run the length of the diaphysis. Because they're made up of osteons and osteons run the entire length of the diaphysis, compact bone right, is good at withstanding compression forces or forces in this direction. Compact bone is not good at withstanding forces in this direction. So the second type of bone is called spongy bone. Spongy bone is also known as cancellous bone. That's the actual name, but I'll never call it cancellous bone. Spongy bone like, makes a little more sense because it looks like a sponge. Spongy bone is very light. It's very porous. In other words, it has a lot of holes. It's found in the epiphyses of long bones. Right, so here's where, here's an epiphysis, and you can see that there's spongy bone located there. And it's made up of structures called trabeculae, which are bony bars and plates. So these individual structures here, right, these are the trabeculae. Some people think that 
because spongy bone is porous that it's not very strong. And that's actually wrong. Spongy bone is very strong, right? And the reason why it's very strong is because these trabeculae, they resemble osteons. But remember, osteons run parallel one another along the length of the shaft. Trabeculae run in all different directions, which means that spongy bone can withstand forces in all different directions. Next, we're going to talk about the process of ossification. Ossification means to make bone. In order to make bone or build bone, you need a special type of cell called an osteoblast. Now, there are other types of cells that are involved with the building of bone, and we've seen these before from the previous chapter. One is the osteocyte, which you now or hopefully will remember that an osteocyte is a mature bone cell that maintains bone. You have an osteoblast, right, which builds bone, and then an osteoclast, which destroys bone. So there's two types of ossification. There are two types of ways of making bone. The first one is called intramembranous ossification. What does intra mean? Inside, in between, right? Membranous refers to what structures within the human body? Membranes. Membranes. And ossification means to make bone. So intramembranous ossification means the making of bone between connected tissue membranes. The making of bone between connective tissue membranes. Endochondral ossification is the second mechanism for making bones. So endo means inside. Chondral refers to what tissue? Cartilage. Right? So endochondral ossification. It's the process of making bone within cartilage. Okay? The process of making bone within cartilage. Right? It's endochondral ossification. All right, so taking a closer look at intramembranous ossification, right? Forget about all of this information here. That's not the important part. The important part, or what you have to understand, is that intramembranous ossification is the process of making bone between connective tissue membranes. And the result of making bone within connective tissue membranes is this classification of bone right here called a flat bone. So intramembranous ossification is responsible for making flat bone bones. Okay, it's responsible for making flat bones. And the way that the process works is this. You have connective tissue membranes, right, on each side of this area right here. And what happens is within this middle, within the middle part of this, these connective tissue membranes, cells spontaneously become osteoblasts and they make bone. And then they make more bone. And then they make more bone until eventually you have what we call as a flat bone. So the second type of bone making or formation of bone is called endochondral ossification. So before we talk about the process of endochondral ossification, let's talk about a couple of things that are involved with endochondral ossification. And the first one is this thing called the primary ossification center. Primary means first. Ossification means the process of making bone. Center is just the location. So the primary ossification center is located in the diaphysis of a long bone. The secondary ossification center, right, or the second area where bone is formed, will be located in the epiphyses of long bones. And again, the cells that are involved with the making of bones, you have these things called chondrocytes, which are cartilage-making cells or mature cartilage cells that maintain cartilage. And then we talked about osteoblasts and osteoclasts previously. So when we take a look at endochondral ossification, remember, it's the formation of bone within cartilage. So cartilage serves as a framework. It serves as a model for bone to be laid upon. And what you have is cartilage being slowly replaced by bone. So the first thing that you need is you need a cartilage model. So this cartilage model again will provide a framework. At the center of this cartilage model, Cells will spontaneously change into osteoblasts. So within the diaphysis, osteoblasts begin laying down bone. The center is called the primary ossification center, right? So in the middle of the diaphysis, osteoblasts begin replacing cartilage with bone. Now, after birth, right, is where you will see the secondary ossification centers appear. Secondary ossification centers are located within the epiphyses. And throughout growth, your bones will continue to lengthen 
as long as you have cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Eventually what happens is there's no more cartilage between the epiphysis and diaphysis and that's when bone growth will stop. So next we're going to talk about how bone continues to lengthen through your adolescence, right? So the time from when you were born to the time you are an adult, this is the process of how bone will grow in length, right? I'm only going to talk about length. It also grows in width, but I'm only going to talk about length. So here, we are going to draw a bone. Right. So this end over here is the epiphysis. This shaft is the diaphysis. And in between, you have this structure right here called the epiphyseal plate or growth plate. The epiphyseal plate is made up of chondrocytes or cartilage making cells, right? And these cartilage making cells are active at making cartilage in this direction. Right. Bone cells are making bone in this direction. So in order for bone to lengthen, cartilage cells or cartilage making cells must remain active. So all these chondrocytes have to be actively making cartilage in this direction. And on this end, bone cells are replacing cartilage to make bone. In essence, the bone is now lengthening. Okay? At some point in time into your adulthood, The bone lengthening process will stop. And what you're left with is a line. In other words, there's no more cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And all you're left with is this line where cartilage used to be. This is now called the epiphyseal line, right? The epiphyseal line. Bone remodeling is just the reshaping of bone. In order to reshape bone, you need special cells called osteoclasts, which we've talked about before and we'll talk about in the repair of a fracture. So the last thing we're going to talk about is bone repair. So back in chapter four, we talked about what happens when tissue gets damaged, right? And when tissue gets damaged, the first thing that happens is swelling. Same thing when bone gets fractured or when bone breaks, the very first thing you see is swelling. So there are four steps to bone repair. The first one is called a hematoma, and this is swelling. The second stage is the formation of um, a cartilaginous callus. This third stage is the formation of a bony callus, and then the final stage is reshaping or remodeling the bone. So as mentioned, the first stage is hematoma. So as I mentioned before, hematoma is swelling. So why do we want swelling into an area? Remember, swelling is a good thing. Swelling brings blood. Blood carries red blood cells, white blood cells, everything to help heal that tissue or begin the repair of tissue. So what happens in a hematoma? Obviously, you've broken the bone, which means you've broken blood vessels. Now, one thing you have to understand is that bone is very vascular. In other words, it has a great blood supply, which means bone will heal faster. So the second stage of bone repair is cartilaginous callus formation. So what happens in cartilaginous callus formation is that the blood clot is replaced by fibrocartilage. Right? And the reason why it's replaced by fibrocartilage is fibrocartilage is very soft. And fibrocartilage allows blood vessels to reconnect. Because it's so soft, blood vessels can kind of snake their way through the cartilage and reconnect. Fibrocartilage also provides a scaffolding or a framework for the next stage, which is bony callus formation. So now bone will replace the cartilage. Okay, so now bone replaces the cartilage. Again, you'll see reattachment of the blood vessels. And then finally, the last stage of bone repair is what we call remodeling. So what happens is you have this large callus, right? This large bulge that sticks out. 
And what happens is remodeling is the reabsorption of that callus, right? And the reabsorption or the destruction of that excess bone occurs by cells called osteoclasts doing that kind of work, okay? They actually reabsorb and destroy that bone. So that reshapes the bone.